Hello. My name is Soga Juro Skenari. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Buyuden Japanese History Channel. We are here today to talk about one of the quintessential legends of Japanese history, the Soga Monogatari, also known sometimes as the Revenge of the Soga Brothers. This story tells the tale of two brothers at the dawn of the Kamakura period, specifically sometime around the early 1190s, who dedicate their lives to taking revenge on the man who killed their father. Nearly every character in this story, including the brothers themselves, is part of the warrior stratum of Japanese society, and several of the founding fathers of Japan's first samurai government, the Kamakura Shogunate, also make neat little cameo appearances. The tale is very much based on a true story, as it is mentioned in the Azuma Kagami, the official history of the Kamakura Shogunate, written around the end of the 13th century. It seems to have been initially transmitted around the country by Yu-Gi-Oh Miko, traveling Shinto priestesses, before eventually being infused with elements of Buddhist thought and becoming a piece of written literature during the 14th and 15th centuries. During the Edo period, it became an extremely popular subject for kabuki plays, often being performed around the New Year holiday in order to appease the main character's vengeful spirits and hopefully welcome in a year full of peace and prosperity. The version of the tale that I'm going to bring to you today is my own personal translation of the story, as recorded in a 1934 book of Japanese children's stories. I chose this version because the author nicely abbreviated the tale down to about 25 pages, much shorter than its original length. But from what I can tell, it seems to hit the majority of the crucial plot points. As you can surmise from that 1934 date, the story was still quite popular even in Japan's pre-war imperial era, where it even made its way into school textbooks on account of its perceived promotion of filial loyalty. After the end of World War II, however, it drastically fell out of popularity, as Japan struggled to escape from the shadow of its militaristic past and reject ideals like the vengefulness and single-minded filial devotion which the story portrays. Because of this, it's not particularly well known today amongst the younger generation of Japanese, having been somewhat swept under the rug as an example of the more shameful aspects of old school Japanese culture. However, it's important to remember that while the tale of the Soga brothers may have been promoted by the imperial Japanese government, it was by no means a product of it, already having some 700 years of history, as I have just described. For this reason, I find it unfortunate that the story continues to remain in such obscurity, and I hope that with this video I can introduce it to a modern audience capable of enjoying it objectively as the historical artifact that it is. As a last note before we begin, I want to warn you that the names of the main characters of this story, the eponymous Soga brothers, change about halfway through. This is because, in pre-modern Japan, it was customary for people to have childhood names that they discarded and replaced with new adult names when they came of age. I considered just using the characters' adult names from the outset, but I ultimately decided against this to keep the story a bit more faithful to its historical setting. I'm sorry if this confuses you, but as people interested in Japanese history, being confused occasionally is something that we all just kind of have to get used to. Anyway, with all that being said, let's get into our story. Soga Kyodai no Hadauchi, The Revenge of the Soga Brothers Once upon a time in Izu province, there was a samurai named Kawazu no Saburo Skeyasu. As the result of a territory dispute in his family, bad blood had developed between him and his cousin, one Kudo Saimon Skitsune. One day, while Skeyasu was out hunting, Skitsune made the cowardly decision to send two of his retainers out to kill him, and they did as they were told and shot him to death at the base of Akazawa Mountain. Skeyasu had two very young sons named Ichiman, who was four, and Hako, who was only two. When their father's corpse was brought back to their home, their mother pulled them close and said, Your foe is Kudo Skitsune. When you grow up, 
promise me you'll avenge your father. And she stared at her husband's body and wept. Their mother didn't feel that she could raise the two boys alone, and so she remarried to a samurai named Sogasuke Nobu, and the trio relocated to his village of Nakamura no Sato. In Japanese, there is an old saying, Tsukihi ni sekimori nashi, the passage of time knows no gatekeeper. And before long, the two boys had reached the ages of nine and seven respectively. On a clear September night, when the moon shone so bright as to seem nearly like daylight, Ichiman and Hako ran out into their garden to play, and there they witnessed a flock of geese flying overhead. Ichiman pointed up to the sky and said, Look, look, it's a flock of geese. One, two, three, four, five, there's five of them up there. They look so happy up there together. I wish we could be like that. Little brother Hako heard this and replied, What do you mean you wish we could be like that? We're happy together playing with our friends every day, aren't we? Ichiman shook his head and responded, I'm not jealous just because they look happy. Look closer. There's a mother, a father, and three young ones. They look so happy being together as a family. And yet, we have only a mother and no father. To this, Hako asked, Why don't we have a father? Where is he? Hako was too young to recall what had happened. Ichiman said he was killed by his enemy. Who's his enemy? Hako asked. It's some man called Kudo Saimon Sketsune, Ichiman cried. We need to hurry up and get big so we can take our revenge on him. Is he strong? Hako inquired to his brother. Of course he's strong, he's a grown-up, but we have no choice. We must avenge our father and put his spirit to rest. At this point, the boy's mother appeared, having overheard their conversation. What are you doing speaking about this in such loud voices? Have you given any thought to what might happen if one of Kudo's allies overheard you? From now on, no matter what happens, you mustn't ever speak of Kudo or the fact that he's your father's enemy. Do you understand me? The boys took their mother's warning to heart, and from that point on, they never spoke of Kudo Skitsune or their desire to take revenge on him. However, from time to time, they would stop and stare sorrowfully at the horizon as the sun set into the far-off mountains and fall deep into thought. Around that time, Kudo Saemon Skitsune had come into the service of the Lord of Kamakura, Minamoto no Yoritomo, and he had been elevated to a position of great responsibility. However, whenever he remembered his having ordered the murder of Kawazuno Saburo Skeyasu, he grew unsettled and worry weighed heavy on his heart. The particular root of his anxiety was the existence of Ichiman and Hako, and the fact that they were slowly growing up into men. Skitsune thought, as long as those two are alive, there's no knowing when my life might be in danger. Somehow, I need to find a way to snuff them out so I can rest easy at night. As he pondered the issue, he hit on a bright idea. He remembered that Skeyasu's father and the grandfather of Ichiman and Hako was a warrior named Ito Skechika, and that he had committed an offense against Minamoto no Yoritomo back when the latter was still in exile in Izu province. Yoritomo had hated Skechika, and when he had captured him during the Battle of Mount Ishibashi during the Genpei War, he had killed him on the spot. Note, this is not historically accurate. Skechka actually took his own life after being captured two years after this in 1182. Anyway, back to the story. One day, Skechka presented himself before Yoritomo and said, My lord, thanks to your great might, nearly all of the Minamoto clan's enemies have been destroyed. However, the grandsons of your old foe, Ito Skechka, still live, and it concerns me that, when they grow to adulthood, they might resent you as their grandfather's enemy and attempt to do you harm. Yoritomo, who was naturally a wary and distrustful man, was immediately swayed by Skechka's words, and he ordered his vassal Kajiwara Kagesue to find and arrest Ichiman and Hako and execute them at Yuigahama Beach. Kagesue immediately made his way to the Soga residence, where he set the young Ichiman and Hako on a pair of horses and began to lead them toward Yuigahama, despite the tearful protests of their mother. Kagesue felt pity for the boys, but he could not refuse the order of his master, and so he pulled the boy's mother away from them and began to hurry toward their destination. However, at this point, the boy's stepfather, Soga Skenobu, emerged from his home and ran toward Kagesue, yelling, Stop! I beg you! If the boys must die, let them at least die by my hand rather than that of a stranger. Kagesue found this to be a reasonable request, and so he permitted it, and together they all made their way to Yuigahama Beach. 
There, they spread out an animal skin for the boys to kneel on, and the two brothers knelt and readied themselves, eyes closed, without crying or making any sort of fuss. Their stepfather, Skinobu, stood behind them and raised his sword, but as he gazed at the boys he had been raising like his own sons, he began to weep and found himself unable to carry out his task. It was at that moment that a cloud of sand was kicked up on the beach as a newcomer came galloping in on horseback. Wait, wait, the man cried, waving some sort of letter above his head. The man was none other than Hatakeyama Shigetada, another powerful vassal of Yoritomo, and a man renowned as much for his mercy as for his valor. When Shigetada had heard of what was happening, he had appealed to Yoritomo to take mercy on the boys, and had managed to change his master's mind, and the letter he had brought with him was proof of this. Thanks to Shigetada, the boys were spared and they headed home to the Soga household with their stepfather, where their mother greeted them literally as though they had come back from the grave. After some discussion, the boys' mother and stepfather decided on a plan to hopefully ensure their future safety. The older brother, Ichiman, would be given his coming-of-age ceremony, called Genpuku in Japanese, whereupon he would take on the name Soga no Juro Skenari and be officially adopted by his stepfather Skenobu as the heir to the Soga household. The younger brother, Hako, would enter into a religious apprenticeship with the monk in charge of Hakone Gongen Shrine and eventually become a monk himself, allowing him to spend his days praying for his late father's salvation in the next life. The parents reasoned that, in this way, the boys could both effectively discard their ties to their late father's family, which would hopefully pacify the paranoid Kudo Skitsune. At the point that this plan was put into action, Ichiman was 13 and Hako was 11 years of age. Obeying his mother's instructions, Hako set out for Mount Hakone, where the Hakone Gongen Shrine was, but in his heart he had no intention of becoming a monk. Day in and day out, all he thought of was how he wanted to grow bigger and stronger and take revenge on Kudo Skitsune. Time passed, and one year, at New Year's time, the shrine was thrown into a great commotion when it was reported that Minamoto no Yoritomo himself would be coming to visit to make a New Year's prayer. Hearing this, Hako was overjoyed, reasoning that if Yoritomo was coming, Kudo Skitsune, being his vassal, would surely be along for the trip. I'll see what sort of a man he is, thought Hako, and if he offers me an opening, I'll cut him down where he stands. At last, the day of Yoritomo's prayer visit came, and the Lord of Kamakura ascended up to the shrine with his great band of followers. Hako stood off to the side, watching, and asked another monk to tell him the names of each of the warriors accompanying Yoritomo. Not knowing Hako's true intentions, the monk happily obliged and began telling him in detail about each of the men in Yoritomo's entourage. The one you see at the front there, that's his lordship Hatakeyama Shigetada. And after him, there's his lordship Wada Yoshimori. Following him, there's his lordship Kajiwara Kagesue. And behind him's his lordship Kudo Saemon Sketsune. The monk continued rattling off names, but at the mention of Kudo, Hako's countenance suddenly grew stern. His eyes grew bloodshot and he stared unblinking at his late father's killer, thinking about how much he loathed the man. He was at last laying eyes on the enemy who had occupied his and his brother's thoughts for so long. At last, Hako, who had wrapped a short sword in cloth and hidden it within his clothing, began to creep around towards Skitsune's rear. He prepared to strike as soon as he saw an opportunity, but right at that moment, Skitsune happened to glance in his direction by chance. As soon as he laid eyes on the young teenager, he nearly jumped in surprise, for you see, Hako was the spitting image of his dead father. Skitsune turned to one of the nearby monks and said, I've heard that Ito Kagechika's grandson has come to apprentice here, but he wouldn't happen to be around at the moment, would he? The monk replied, Why, that's him right over there, the boy with the pine and wisteria patterns embroidered on his clothing. The boy he was pointing at was of course none other than Hako. Skitsune beckoned Hako over to him and placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. So you're Hako, are you? I'm your father's cousin. I'm afraid I've neglected to keep in touch with your side of the family as of late, but how is your mother? Is she well? You ought to come visit me sometime. He then reached into his garments and pulled out a small sword, handing it over to Hako and saying, I haven't much on me at the moment, but here, take this as a gift from your cousin once removed. 
Hako was filled with frustration and humiliation, but there was little he could do but to accept the sword with a meek, thank you, sir. After this incident, another five or six years passed, and Hako at last grew into a young man of seventeen. One day, the head monk of the Hakone Gongen Shrine summoned him and said, Now that you're seventeen, it's about time that you shaved your head and officially joined this shrine as a monk. In his heart, Hako was quite flustered by this development, but unable to say as much, he simply nodded and said, It would be an honor. The head monk promptly contacted his mother, and together the two decided a date for Hako's entry into the clergy. The night before the established date, a distraught Hako quietly sneaked away from the shrine and made his way back to his hometown, where he stealthily managed to make contact with his older brother, Ichiman, who was now going by his adult name of Juro. Juro was shocked to see Hako again after so many years, especially knowing that he was due to become a monk in just a few hours, but sympathizing with his younger brother and remembering their pact to kill Kudo Sketsune together, he decided to help him. He brought him to the residence of Hojo Tokimasa, a powerful samurai whose daughter was the wife of Minamoto no Yoritomo himself. Tokimasa had once been married to the brother's late aunt, and on the basis of this old family connection, they begged him to carry out Hako's Genpuku, his coming-of-age ritual which would elevate him to adulthood right then and there. Tokimasa was swayed by their pleas, and under his supervision, Hako was officially made a man and rechristened as Sogagoro Tokimune, with the Toki part of his new name being a gift from Tokimasa. The Genpuku ceremony was a symbol of a young man's becoming a full-fledged member of society, almost the polar opposite of the head-shaving ceremony for entering the priesthood, which symbolized one's leaving society behind. Having completed his Genpuku and done it under the patronage of a great samurai like Hojo Tokimasa no less, turning around and entering the priesthood would be off the table for a while. The boy's mother was furious when she found out what had happened, but what was done was done. From this point on, the brothers spent every free moment that they had practicing the arts of combat, and before they knew it, another three years had gone by. Juro was now 22, and Hako, whom we shall from now on call by his adult name of Goro, had become a young man of 20. They had reached the age where it was time to stop talking about revenge and at last start doing, and they began actively seeking an opportunity to strike back against Kudo Skitsune. That opportunity finally came around in May of that year, when it was decided that Minamoto no Yoritomo would hold a great hunt at the base of Mount Fuji. The brothers nearly jumped for joy when they heard the news. We've done it! If we can sneak into the hunting area, we'll undoubtedly have a chance to take down Kudo. Thrilled with their luck, Juro and Goro began making their preparations. The brothers suspected that they would not be able to carry out their mission and also live to tell the tale, so they visited their mother to make their goodbyes. She greeted them tearfully, saying, If only your father were alive, the two of you would have been heading off to that hunt as invited guests. She then pulled out a new pair of kosode, the garments that were the standard attire for samurai in that age, and presented them to her sons. There's no helping how things have turned out. At the very least, change into these so that you can go wearing something new. It's just a small token of your mother's love. To Juro, she gave a kosode decorated in splendidly blooming autumn flowers, and to Goro, a white one with Chinese-style patterns and embroidery in the shape of butterfly wings. The brothers accepted the gifts reverently and spoke their final words of parting to their mother, before at last leaving her and their old home behind. Their mother watched them from the home's Engawa veranda until they had at last receded out of sight into the distance. The brother's next step was Mount Hakone, where they visited the monk under whom Goro had formerly apprenticed. After telling him of the coming hunt at Mount Fuji, he brandished a pair of swords from within the shrine and gave them to the young men. The first of the swords was called Mijin and had been donated to the shrine by Kiso Yoshinaka, Minamoto no Yoritomo's late cousin, and the second sword, called Tomokiri Maru, was an old blade that had been passed down through the Minamoto family for generations. Moved by the monk's kindness, the brothers professed their deep gratitude before heading back down the mountain and continuing on their journey. At last, the time for the hunt at Mount Fuji was at hand. 
It was a style of hunting called makigari, in which a large number of attendants stationed up on the mountain raised a great war cry all at once, and began driving the beasts of the mountain down toward the plain below. Down at the foot of the mountain, the samurai hunters waited for the beasts to emerge, and when they did, they competed with one another to take the most and the biggest trophies and earn fame and renown from their peers. It was a terribly chaotic and intense experience, with the shouts of the hunters and the roars of the hunted echoing far and wide throughout the area. Because of this, the brothers managed quite easily to slip into the crowd, but no matter how many times they tried, they could not find a good opportunity to strike at Kudo Sketsune, and before they knew it, the hunt had ended. Knowing that the next day, all the gathered samurai would make their way back to Kamakura, the brothers resolved to kill Sketsune that night. It would be the last chance they would have. First, the brothers penned a letter to their mother, and together with the beautiful kosode garments that she had given them, and most of their other possessions, they entrusted a pair of retainers to deliver it to their village. Then, having made their peace with the mortal world, the brothers began preparing for their night attack. Juro clad himself in a white under tunic and a bird-patterned hitatare coat, tying his sleeves up to the elbows, tightly affixing his eboshi hat, and donning the sword Mijin which he had received at Mount Hakone. Goro wore a butterfly pattern hitatare coat, tying up his sleeves and tightly fastening his hat just like his brother, and for his weapons he chose not only the Minamoto blade from Mount Hakone, but also, ironically, the short sword which he had received from Sketsune himself. With their preparations complete, the brothers stepped out into the night, and Juro lit a torch and held it out toward his brother. Goro, this is the last time we'll look on each other's faces, he cried. By the light of the torch, the brothers held back tears as they gazed upon one another for one last time. By this point, it was well into nighttime, and a soft summer drizzle had begun to fall. With their torch guiding their way, Goro and Juro quietly made their way through the pitch-dark camp of the hunt participants. Thankfully for the brothers, the fatigue from several days of hunting had taken its toll, and not a man in the camp seemed to be remaining awake. At last, the brothers caught sight of Kudo Sketsune's crest, a flower of the Japanese quince shrub. They had at last reached their arch-enemy's shelter. Working hard to suppress their excitement, the brothers thrust open the shelter's doors and burst inside. To their surprise, the inside of the shelter was as silent as a tomb, and there didn't seem to be even a single inhabitant. The brothers began to despair, thinking that their worst fear had come to pass, and that Sketsune had already departed the hunting ground. However, right at that moment, a lantern appeared in the darkness outside Sketsune's shelter, held aloft by a lone warrior who had come to investigate the scene. The brothers, naturally, prepared themselves for a fight, but upon taking a closer look, they saw that it was a familiar face. The man before them was a retainer of Hatakeyama Shigetada, the powerful samurai who had saved them from execution so many years before. This retainer, whose name was Honda Chikatsune, had known of the brothers since they were children, and seeing them in Kudo Sketsune's abandoned shelter, he immediately guessed what was going on. Empathizing with their cause, he quietly pointed to another nearby shelter, and then, without speaking a word, went on his way. The brothers realized what had happened. They had just been shown the true whereabouts of their target. The two rushed over to the other shelter and stormed through the door, and lo and behold, there on the floor, in a drunken stupor, lay their father's killer, Kudo Sketsune. Juro kicked Sketsune's pillow out from beneath his head and cried, Kudo Simon Sketsune, enemy of our father, prepare to die. Sketsune leapt up from the floor in a great confusion, yelling, Intruder! What is this nonsense? I am no one's enemy. I won't let you say you've forgotten, cried Juro in response. We are Soga Juro Skenari and Soga Goro Tokimune, and you murdered our father, Kawazuno Saburo Skeyasu. Now it's time for you to have a taste of the 18 years of pain we've endured thanks to you. Sketsune attempted to grab his nearby sword, but before he could, he felt Juro's blade cut deep into his shoulder. Then, without missing a beat, Goro skewered him through the waist, and within a few moments it was all over. Kudo Sketsune was dead. The brothers were elated at having achieved their long-held desire, 
but almost immediately cries of arrest the brigands began to echo throughout the vicinity. Warriors began to emerge from every shelter in the camp, and the brothers quickly found themselves thoroughly surrounded. With neither a place to flee nor any intention to do so, Goro and Juro began to fight with every ounce of their strength, but with several hundred enemies pressing in on them, their defeat was inevitable. Juro was at last slain by a warrior called Nitanoshiro Taratsune, and Goro, dispirited by his elder brother's death, was captured and restrained. Goro was eventually brought before Minamoto no Yoritomo himself, where, without showing even a bit of guilt or regret, he described why he and his brother had done what they had. Yoritomo was moved by the tale of the brother's bravery and filial piety, and he considered sparing Goro's life and letting him off with a lighter punishment. However, in the midst of the questioning, the nine-year-old son of the slain Kudo Sketsune, a boy named Inubomaru, ran up and began showering blows on the restrained Goro. Goro himself could only laugh, knowing exactly how the young boy felt, and he even encouraged the lad to go and get a stick so he could beat him a bit more effectively. Seeing the young Inubomaru overcome with the thirst for revenge, Yoritomo realized that Goro could not be spared and would have to die for his actions. Soga Goro Tokimune, I find your slaying of Kudo Sketsune to be neither unreasonable nor unjust, spoke the Lord of Kamakura. However, if I spare you punishment, then every man with vengeance in his heart will think that he is liable to receive my empathy, and the country will be overtaken by lawlessness. Please do not think me unmerciful. Goro, content with having fulfilled his mission and certain that his brother awaited him in the great beyond, raised no objection. He was turned over to the custody of the young Inubo Maru and his retainers, who took him to a place called Matsugasaki near Mount Fuji and executed him there, at last putting an end to the cycle of revenge. Back in the brothers' village, a great memorial service was held, with the head monk of Hakone Gongen Shrine even making his way over to pray for Goro and Juro's happiness in the next life. Minamoto no Yoritomo made a gift of land to the brother's grieving mother so that she could continue to honor their memory each year, and he even went so far as to build a shrine to the brothers at the foot of Mount Fuji, a shrine which we know today as the Soga Hachimangu. Every year in May, festivities were held at this shrine, honoring the brothers' spirits, and in time, visitors from both near and far began to make the trip over to worship there. In this way, the brothers gradually entered into legend as model sons and paragons of the samurai spirit, and they continue to live on in our memory even today. And that, my friends, is the end of the tale of the revenge of the Soga brothers. Personally, I can't help but feel that it's a story that doesn't really know what it wants to teach us. Is revenge good? Is it bad? On the one hand, it will ultimately get you executed after turning you into the very thing that you hate. But on the other hand, it may also make you a historical legend with your own government-sponsored shrine. Many of the characters themselves also feel a bit confused, with the brother's mother, for example, actively stoking their desire for vengeance as children, but then trying to turn them away from that path when they start to enter adolescence. Then again, as I mentioned in the intro, this video is based off of a very condensed version of the story, so I don't know what exactly ended up getting left on the cutting room floor. I will leave a link down in the description to a full 240 page translation of the story into modern Japanese that you can read for free on the Japanese National Diet Library's website, for anyone out there feeling particularly adventurous. There does also seem to be an English translation in existence from the late 1980s by one Thomas J. Kogan, but it appears to be a rather scarce publication, so you may need to do some digging to track it down. Anyway, muddled themes or not, I had a lot of fun exploring this old story and putting this video together, and I'd like to do some more projects like it in the future. What did you guys think? Did you enjoy this old samurai folktale? Would you like to see more videos like this where I find lesser known Japanese legends and dredge them up into the light of day? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Anyway, that's all from me. As always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and boom!